Okay, my let's keep it real people. I know you love it. This is a real treat when you get to see someone. So you are going to get to see my next guest, Leonard Lee Bouchel. He's a California certified substance abuse counselor who recently celebrated 27 years clean and sober. Woo -woo! He is the founder of Writers in Treatment, as well as the director of the Real Recovery Film Festival and Symposium, which he founded in 2008. Leonard also is the editor and publisher of the weekly addiction recovery e-bulletin, as well as the producer of the annual Experience Strength and Hope Awards in Los Angeles. Leonard, it's so nice to see you. I'm very excited to be here with you because your middle name is Joy, isn't it? It is. And it I used to say that you're like a joy provider. <laughs> you know, I always said my whole mission in life is pretty simple. I want to spread joy. And for many years, it was fitness was my vehicle to spread joy. So any way I can spread joy, I'm all about. Okay. Well, hopefully that'll spread to me. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, Letter. All right. So we always start off asking my guest if there is just one word you could pick that best describes your past 30 days, what would that word be and why? What word would you pick? Roller coaster like Ooh. Is that two words? Roller that's okay. I use pure joy sometimes, so that's okay. Roller coaster. Roller, like yeah. All right, tell us more. Well, I have been working uh, you told me some of your listeners run businesses and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, I've been running, I started a film festival 14 years ago. We're actually having our 14th annual Real Recovery Film Festival in Los Angeles oh. in a couple of weeks, oh. uh, seven days in, in, in Hollywood. And uh, we were online for the last two years because of the you know what. And yeah. previously, we've always been in New York for a week in Los Angeles. And it was something that came to me 14 years ago as a good idea. And obviously it, it took off and, and I've been doing it ever since. Um, and to really, I won't say air the dirty laundry. <laughs> okay, air the dirty laundry. I, uh, things have been going along really well. I've been working with my uh co film festival producer director mm -hmm. for five and a half years and on monday morning she told me she was leaving oh oh uh, at the oh. end of the month oh. uh, and and we had an agreement that she would be till the end of the year and then we would figure out what we were, how we were going to proceed if we were going to proceed next year yeah. So it was all set until December 31st, because I also produced the annual Experience, Strength and Hope Awards at the Skirball Museum every year. Yes. That's happening. Uh, where are you located, by the way? I'm in Philly, but I visit California a lot. And I saw that it's December 7th and I was cracking up. You've got to tell them about that, because when it's... <laughs> Well, no I, gowns, no toxins, no Uggs. I'm like, I'm in. <laughs> right. But fancy chic is the dress code. That's what uh, that's what Sandy's talking about, in case anybody out there doesn't know. We do have a dress code. No gowns, no tuxes, and no Uggs. Yeah. It used to be no Birkenstock. <laughs> but I don't know if people still, if they're still around. They are. They, they are. are. I just bought a pair for my 19 year old son. Yes, they're around and they are awesome. <laughs> okay, I'll look into that. Uh, <laughs> seriously. Uh, so that event we do at the at a museum every every year. And it's, it's a, we, we honor different mm. high profile individuals. Yeah, who've written memoirs about their career and their addiction and recovery journeys. Uh, we started out years ago with with Lou Gossett Jr. and and have had and these are people 
And the award is not for being clean and sober. It's for writing. It's for their memoir. Yeah, yeah. So we've had Buzz Aldrin and the co-founder of Duran Duran, mm -hmm. John Taylor, and Jody Sweeten, and 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 other, you know, really high-profile individuals who are openly, uh, you know, dramatic and expressive and and proud of of their journey, even the the valleys that a lot of us yeah. had to go through to get to uh, to there. So we have that happening in December. And so Monday morning, I was informed that someone I've been working with for five and a half years mm. would not be mm. fulfilling the promise and leaving at the end of the month. So um, my heart's pounding. Oh, I, just, I know what that feels like. I, I had the same thing happen. So go on. And I thought, oh, there's so many ways I can react right now. <laughs> yes, yes. And I think the best reaction is not reacting. Yeah. Uh, actually, and just taking it in and going, is what, and, and realizing, how is this going to make me a better, stronger person? Mm. This is going to shake me up, wake me up. Uh, you know, I, I've made a few phone calls. People were very enthusiastic about helping, even though okay. they might not be in a position to help. People say, if there's anything I can do for you, let me know. I'll come in, I'll make phone calls, I'll send yeah. emails. People you know, who yeah. Yeah. Um, are, are, are very respectable. So on that hand, I got to see, oh, people are supportive. Yeah. Uh, and I can't say anything other than be grateful for the five and a half years yeah. we had as a, a working team where we got a tremendous a lot accomplished. Mm. And, uh, you know, the newsletter is now 10 years old, the Addiction Recovery Newsletter. She's the associate editor oh. of that. So that leaves me in a, in a not a big a bind as the other situations. And it's so curious I'm talking about this. I'm probably only talking about this because you're open and mm. you're positive. Yeah. And I just came from my therapist. So <laughs> I've been talking about it anyway, but I wasn't done talking about it, obviously. By the way, this is very important. I want to say something. Really. The book High, <laughs> Confessions of a Cannabis Addict, is available on Amazon. Oh now. my, you're so, I, I love you. It starts in Philadelphia. A what? lot of it takes place in Philadelphia. No. Oh yeah. Oh, you didn't look at you. Okay, I'll have to. Uh, no. I'll have to uh, have somebody send you a copy. Yeah. It's all Phil. It's mostly Philadelphia. Tell me more. Why? I guess you lived there. Well, there was one night when the police raided my house with my mother in the living room, and they broke through the door, which sounds very dramatic, but it was in the middle of the summertime, so it was a screen door. You know, yeah. those really thin screen doors, so it wasn't hard for them. I to know. Break it. In fact, it was unlocked. So they just came into the house. We got taken down to the round house. We got arrested because they arrested her because she, she didn't want to let them go into her bedroom. That phrase, she, they might find her toys or whatever. Uh, and they said, and so they arrested her for interfering with the uh, obligations of a police officer. So me, they arrested because they found marijuana. Yeah. Uh, her they arrested. So we're both in the paddy wagon. Do they still have paddy wagons? I think they call it something different, but I like paddy wagon. Let's okay. go with that. Yeah. That's, I hope that's not. They pull a, up and put you in it. I, I get hope that's it. not derogatory to the Irish citizen. Well, I'm Irish and I don't take offense, so we're good. Okay. So, uh, so we got arrested. As far as I know, it was her first time getting arrested. I got fingerprinted. She did not. Um, hmm. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's back up. We don't want to give too much away because I did read the reviews from the book and it's. I can't wait to read. It's incredible. But were you and your mom like a duo with the, the, the dealing with the In the back drugs? seat of the cop car. And it's like I said in the book, I said, thank God they didn't handcuff us together because that would have been weird. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and since then, anytime a woman brings out handcuffs, I, I, I have like PTSD. <laughs> I even see it there, even if they're plastic. I can't. Oh, no, no. Oh, my God. You know? Get a scarf. I, I don't do handcuffs. 
but in Philadelphia at the time, I got it busted at another time. And our attorney, oh, actually, it was for that time. Our attorney, who we believed was maybe connected, and if you know what I mean. Yeah. Simone, I'll say his name. He's probably dead. Bob Simone. We, we I'm all. Sure he's dead. <laughs> and he says, I can get you out. I, I, I said, he says, I can take care of this case for $3,000. Now, this was a long time ago. $3,000. So $3,000. I said, what's that for? He says, well, it's, it's $750 for the mayor, $750 for the prosecuting attorney, $750 for the judge, and $750 for him. City of brotherly love, baby! And I said, okay. <laughs> and when we got to court and my attorney, my, not uh, my public defenders, starts to say something, the judge says, I think it would be better off for your client if you said nothing further. <laughs> Case dismissed. <laughs> so that's why I like Philly, but it's also why I moved out of Philly, because I was in California once, and I saw a speech by Jerry Brown. Uh, remember Governor Moonbeam, who was involved with the uh, yeah. wonderful singer? And it was like, there's Frank Rizzo, and there's Jerry it's sort of like that it's yeah so i thought wow california there's actually people i'd want to vote for there's actually mm -hmm. things going on here and let me say this this is one of the greatest advancements in california uh jurisprudence if i may a obviously the legalization of marijuana was a big win and they just governor newsom he might run for president i think he's a good guy jaywalking is no longer illegal in los angeles have you ever been oh i have and i got yelled out by my friends because so many of my friends live out there and they're like what are you doing finally it's no longer a crime i'm just gonna come out just so i could jaywalk <laughs> pick out you know sunset boulevard ventura boulevard hollywood yeah. boulevard and just <laughs> walk back and forth big, across the that's street. a big win that's no, a big win Having spent a lot of time in Philadelphia and New York, the idea of having it, it's against a lot of jaywalk. You cross it's, in the middle, it's faster. Come on. And if you make yes. it across, it's a thrill. In the middle, right? You don't yeah. have to want to walk to the corner. Yeah. You know, you're an adult. You have eyes. You can, you're not going to kill yourself. You're going to be careful. Yeah. You know, so, and if you're working out like you tell people to do, you can really jog across <laughs> the street. You can get there fast before the cars, uh, Use oh, target practice. All right, listen, we got we got back up a little bit. I could just see we're gonna run out of time. We'll have to bring you back. But how long were you in Philly? How many years? Thirty. Thirty. Okay. So you moved when you were thirty? Yes. To California? Yes. Okay. I had been I uh, had a we recently had a child. And my son's mother uh, okay. decided to take him and move to Florida. And I thought, hmm, I'm unencumbered. And I was, I wanted to change my life because in mm. Philadelphia, I became a drug dealer. And it was very dangerous and easy at the same time. Now, and did you deal, deal just? I don't say, were you just dealing marijuana or other drugs too? Uh, there was a South American import that they made from cocoa leaves. Or not mm -hmm. cocoa, coca leaves. Coca. So I was selling the, the final product of that, uh, only for 13 years. So it was mostly weed. And okay. I thought, this is a really, I want to, I want, new horizon so to speak and i yeah. knew some people and i moved to marin county just north of the golden gate bridge you know mm -hmm. sausalito and and, and uh, that area and and it was a good move it was a good move and ultimately my son ended up coming to live with me when he was very oh. small i had to take him to middle school every day and we you know we had a, a really nice life up there it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful place.
Yeah, it is pretty, isn't it? I tell everybody, if you get close to me, you're either going to move to Florida or California. Every one of my closest friends have moved to Florida or California. I guess they like it warm. That's why, you know? I suppose. Um, I don't I know. Suppose. Although All right, so he, San Francisco is not warm. You know, it's, it's uh, that's true. not warm. It's a little warmer warm. than Philly, though. A little warmer than Philly. Yeah, I remember those winters. <laughs> the yeah. colder it gets there, the better I feel. Oh. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about what made you write your book. And when did you start writing it? Because some people say it took me it years. Some people say like a year. Yeah, years. It took years of working at it. And because I have a full-time job, so it wasn't something I could like devote mm -hmm. my, my time to. Of course, there's weekends and there's this and that. But I have to thank uh, you know, Mr. and Mrs. COVID-19 for getting me to finish it. Because it was only mm -hmm. when the lockdown happened in LA, which was pretty severe as I'm sure it was around the country, that I thought, I have no excuse not to finish it now. I'm not going to the movies at night. I'm not going to restaurants on the weekend. I'm not going anywhere. I have time now to finish the book because social life That's true. was canceled. There's no yeah. dinners. There's no. So thank God I, I persevered and I ended up finishing. And I'm really proud of how it came out. And I know I do a lot of things that are cool, but nothing I can say I'm proud. Uh, but this I'm very proud of. And there's lots of photographs in it. I hear it's fairly funny. Some people call it a page turner. Uh, I know. I heard that a lot. Everyone's like, how could you make such serious things so funny? But you do. It's all, Yes, it's only serious if you get caught. Anyway, so there's <laughs> photographs and it's uh, a lot about Philly, a lot about addiction, a lot about recovery, about how lucky I got that I thought I was having a nervous breakdown and I just went through a serious breakup with, with a femme fatale and um, and I found someone taking a picture of my house and I thought that has to be and he didn't look like a real estate agent, mm. you know, the way he was dressed and um, and a very close friend of mine had just gotten arrested like a few days before that. And I thought they're go they're going to take pictures of my house, take it back to jail, show him and have him confirm that this is where he was, you know, acquiring his mm. necessary wares to go resell. Um, and so I immediately packed up and I ran into a woman who had gone to a rehab, the only person I knew on earth. And uh, I was at a phone booth and she came over and, and uh, I ended up driving to a rehab three weeks later. You know, there's a lot of interesting little miraculous coincidences. Yeah. Uh, that I, that I, that's are in the book. And, and that's what makes it funny because coincidences are, are interesting, are funny. And uh, I've never said that before. And now that I've said it, I'd like to retract it. Because coincidences are not necessarily always funny, but what happened? I know what you mean. I know what you was, mean. Was uh, that I ended up pulling up to the rehab, uh, going up to the front desk and saying, uh, "Is is this where I check in?" And the woman says, "Check in. This isn't a hotel. This is a hospital. This is where you get admitted." You know, then you have the hospital band. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I wanted to leave right away, but uh, they give you a book when you get there. Uh, they give you uh, this book. Now, how old were you at this time, Leonard? I was 44. Okay. I had dealt drugs on a daily basis for 23 years, and I've yeah. been high for 26 years. I never got high and didn't get high and got high and took a break and didn't get high. I was high from day one at 17 to 44. I got high every single day. And, and, um, and so they give you this book. I'll show you. According to the rules, I'm not allowed to say I'm a member. 
Ah. I am a secret cult organization. Shh. Uh, Mom's the word. And uh, and I thought, oi, oi, you know, I thought, oi, what, what am I going to do with this? But I opened it that night because they don't allow you to take in any outside literature, although I did sneak in a couple magazines. Uh, no outside yeah. literature, not even... No, okay. not even Eckhart Tolle or Deepak Chopra. They want you to focus on yourself, and they want okay. you to read this book. Okay, I got gotcha. you. You know, you can do that at any time. It's sort of, uh, but in the forward somewhere, there's the name Carl Jung. So the fact that Carl Jung was being referenced, I thought, hmm, that's interesting. He's considered one of the unofficial founders of Alcoholics Anonymous because they used something that he said as one of their most I did not know that. Edits. Know. Oh, yes. And he was very in touch with Bill Wilson, mm. who's, who's the co-founder. Uh, they were in touch, and he said something, and they adopted it, something about, uh, you know, they call alcohol spirits because it's really like a low-level search for spirituality. And Ooh, uh, I did not know that it's either. replacing spiritual life with the... With it's replacing a spiritual life for a life of yearning for spirituality by drinking and getting drunk. Now, a lot of people might say, I didn't drink to find God, but maybe they did, they just didn't realize it. So, the fact that Carl Jung's name was in there it made me think, okay, I'll stay. And then the third day there, um, I had an epiphany. I had an experience. I had a something that I describe as a miracle. Uh, you know, more miraculous than I felt when I cut the umbilical cord from my son to his mm. mother because I was officially yeah. at the birth. Yeah. Suddenly, all desire for drugs left me. And I hadn't gone a day without getting high for 26 years. Uh, mm. The only time I didn't get high, and I regret it, was when I was in Japan for three weeks because of Paul McCartney. I don't know, remember the famous? He got busted with weed going into Japan. So I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would take pot to Jamaica. I would take pot to Puerto Rico, I took pot to England and France and any other country I ever went to, I took my own stash. Yeah. Even Jamaica, I took my stash because when you land at Montego Bay to get to Negril, it's like an hour and a half ride. And I thought, I can't go an hour and a half without getting high. So I'd have to take my own weed. Uh, so here I was in this rehab and suddenly I realized I'm never gonna get high again. I don't ever want to get high again. I'm not saying I will never, but at that moment I thought, I don't want to get high. Wow. I don't need to get high. I don't want to mm. get high. And depending on what it says in my obituary, maybe I won't have gotten high whenever that is. Yeah. Next what? year, next decade, I hope. <laughs> my mother lived to 86, so that's sort of like my goal. Oh, right. You know, like genetically, and she smoked and did and never exercised. I don't smoke, and I've taken her up on the no exercise rule also because <laughs> I've never I've never suffered a sports injury in my. Life. She haven't moved. <laughs> I walk a lot. Oh, well, that's exercise. Come on. And I'm on that's... the third floor. I walk up the steps. Well, then you uh, exercise is movement, you know, uh, you don't have I to do, go to a gym. Go I ahead. Do at least a mile or two a day. And in New York, I do four a day. When I'm in New York, like from downtown to uptown. I, it's fun. That's because it's fun. fun. And walking the steps to the subway when you can't walk it. That's why yeah. they say New York is the healthiest city in the country. And walk, baby. Of the mobility. Um, oh, my so growing up in Logan was really fascinating. My saving grace was we, could, we had the same house for 20 years. The first 20 years of my life, I was in the same house. And you being in Philly or from Philly know what it's like to have the same. The neighbors never moved. There was no. They don't. Move. They don't. 
I live in the suburbs, but I, I, my health clubs are in center city. Yeah, they don't move. They don't go anywhere. No, especially not 50 years ago. Yeah, now they do, but they didn't. I know. There was no, no, no one got divorced. Uh, You know, the, the, the they were just miserable. My, the danger of my neighborhood be, can be summed up by what my mother would, would say. Be careful when you go out. Don't get hit by any stray insults. <laughs> there wasn't that much gunplay. <laughs> but there were there, there were those. Oh, things. your mom uh, must have been a hoot. <laughs> yeah, she was a hoot. She was definitely a hoot. She, it's in the book. One of my favorite moments with my mother was I got... Uh, suspended from middle school for something and uh, and that night my brother had just gotten a car and we were driving past my junior high Jay Cook junior high I hope nobody from there is watching and I had a BB gun a, you know with the co2 cartridges oh. a BB gun I said mom can I shoot at the windows and she said okay Bruce slow down let him shoot at the windows <laughs> my brother's name and i just you know and i went the oh, next day to see if there's oh, a oh mom oh you mom don't break the window with a bb you just put that little hole in it oh uh, yeah i know yeah because she thought i shouldn't have been suspended either uh, but I, uh. I i used to hitchhike to high school and my first period teacher was never upset if i was late she just knew i didn't get a ride you know, it was like a, a, another time but literally, like I said, the family never had a car. I never had a car. So I would either have to take the bus or hitchhike. And it was more interesting to hitchhike. Anyway, uh, all knee high on the boulevard. I say these things, so hopefully a few people from Philly are having euphoric recall. Of <laughs> they Philly. are. The West River Drive, the East River Drive. Oh, my God. The suburbs. Yes. I won't even ask you what suburbs you're in because then I'll start telling stories about it. No, no. I live in Berwyn, PA, which is about 35 minutes from Philly, and it's about five minutes from Villanova University. Is that with the train? You take the train? Is that the train that goes through? Yeah, the train goes right through. Bryn Mawr and Swarthmar. Yeah, yeah. And some other places that haven't been back yeah. for a while. Uh, yeah. But I, I know. I like it here. I, I, I would too. It's a livable city. You're near New York, you're near DC. They have an airport. That's what I love about it. <laughs> because I can go an hour and a half on a train to New York, a um, couple hours from DC, a couple hours from the shore, the mountains. Yeah. That's what I love about it. Yeah, I'm just so curious to wonder if there are any people still listening to our personal private conversation. <laughs> well, it's being recorded, so I'll, if, you know. Oh, good. <laughs> if they're not still listening, it's probably because they're at their computer ordering your book. Yeah, confessions yeah. of a cannabis. All right, listen, uh, I got to get a few of these questions in or they're going to okay, have my head. Yeah. Okay. okay. Listen. <laughs> you're, you're who? You know, it, it's, it's Yom Kippur, so not eating gets me high. Fasting is how Jesus used to get high. Every once in a while, he would do one of those fasts. That's and a shout would, out to all yeah. the Jewish people listening. I did not know. It is it really Yom Kippur today? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's not something you can lie about. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be. That would really be a sin. All right. Wait. So, so I know for you, like you talked about, you were there yeah. three days, and a miracle happened. But for other people, which I know you've mentioned, you know. They go in and out. You know, I have friends. Easy. Yeah, it I have friends easy. that are, you know, they've been sober. Then they think they can have a beer or two. Most mm. of it for me has been with um, my friends with alcohol. Yeah. And then they fall off and they fall back. And they're like, do you really believe this will ever change for them? Especially like a lot of these people are, are yes, in their once they stop, Once they drop, yeah, once they stop trying to get sober. Okay, you need to say more. It will, it will change for them. Once they Either, stop trying to get sober. So help me out here. Then what they'll just be alcoholics. Okay. Or, or problem drinkers. 
you know, it's not, it's not, everybody, not everybody who quits drinking was an alcoholic. Uh, you know, problem drinkers, heavy drinkers. It, it usually takes consequences to get people to try and stop. Uh, mm. I, you know, I didn't stop because of the consequences, even though I almost died, you know, uh, really died once. Uh, you know, I didn't have anybody who, anyway, that's besides the point. I didn't have anybody who's threatening to leave me. I wasn't yeah, yeah, yeah. fired from my job because yeah. I was a drug dealer. Yeah. And I worked for myself. Uh, it's sort of like, you know, maybe, maybe they'll pass away. Hopefully they don't run over a family at the intersection or even people jaywalking. Hopefully they don't kill anybody and then have yeah. that to live with. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe if they thought of that every time they wanted to take a drink or they're, um, they're not being honest with themselves. They're in denial is more powerful than drug addiction because it's all in the head. And yeah. if you're saying, I can have two beers tonight, but the last time you said that, or the last 10 times you said that, you ended up having a six pack and passing out on your big fat beer belly, you know, and, but you still think that's what it's gonna be like, you're denying it. And you're also being incredibly selfish mm -hmm. because there's probably, you know, an alcoholic affects at least seven people in their lives children, family, aunts, yeah. uncles, employees, employers, you're being selfish. And maybe that is the ultimate crime. Mm. Like you're willing to sacrifice the well-being of others for your own petty Ooh. need to Ooh. get a buzz, even though you can't stop. Maybe they should cut off their hands. It's extreme. I, don't know. I admit it's extreme. <laughs> you think? <laughs> but it could save some lives. Okay. Oh my God. All right. Or so maybe they should pray to God to fill them with a little bit of light that far surpasses the benefits of the drink. Oh, let's go with that one. Let's go okay. with that one. Uh, you know, I understand the the concept of social drinking. Uh, yeah. Sometimes, you know, I can't say I wish I could because if you're not drinking to get intoxicated, why bother? <laughs> you know, I see people with wine, a big glass. I hear this of all the time. I hear this all the time. Yeah. Seriously. What's the point, what's, right? What's the point? It's not healthy. They've done so many studies in the last five years that I know of because I published the Addiction Recovery e and and we cover all the science reports about alcoholism. Cancer, cancer, alcohol can definitely be attributed to causing, to helping cause cancer. Maybe it's not the only cause, but it definitely is a contributor. It will lower your odds of not getting cancer if you drink. So there's no health reasons anymore. That was all poppycock. Poppycock, I like that word, poppycock. <laughs> Uh, okay, I, I, but, I, I, okay. I assume this is a, a GR show or RG, general yeah. rated, children. If it's for children, <laughs> but let's back up with the social. It's for teenagers who have a crush on you, and that's why they tune in every week. No, back up. So listen, mm -hmm. social. Let's go back to the social. For many people, for I get you're saying if you if you're not getting intoxicated, why? But for some people, even just having a glass of white or red wine in a social setting, yeah. even just holding it relaxes them. That's good. It relaxes uh, well, them. So, you yes. know, a lot of people will go yes. in and if they don't have a drink, they're nervous because there's people and they have to talk well, to them and they hate small talk. <laughs> it's the people that can't stop drinking that yes. we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So... Social Back up for social drinkers is the, yeah. is wonderful. Yeah, yeah, I get it. So now, biggest question, and I was actually a part of this debate, and I stepped back. One of the people in my group said they finally admitted to themselves they're a functional alcoholic, okay. and the other person said 
but you go to work every day. You know, they're a big time lawyer. I would never yeah. know. And the woman goes, that's why it's called functional alcoholic, yes. you know? Listen, there's a new movie out now, which you would like. Oh, what is it? It's starring, uh, what's her name? And Kevin Klein. Um, not what's McKenzie. her name? I like her. She's awesome. Not Mackenzie Phillips. Oh. Kevin Klein and Sigourney Weaver. Oh, Sigourney Weaver. Just came out on Friday. It's called The Good House. Oh. And it is about a functional alcoholic. And it's not a bad, it's not a good movie, but it's a good film if you have any alcoholic issues because it does show her, mm. her denial and her going to a rehab and be is an intervention scene. And it, and it addresses it very clearly. I'm sure it's from a book called The Good yeah. House. Yeah. Uh, that, that's probably worth worth watching. It's definitely worth watching. One big question I have to get in before we go in, which is, I'm sure you hear this all the time, and it's a huge debate, is what, like they've heard so many different definitions of what is an alcoholic. So they want to know when you say someone's an alcoholic. It's easy. That's in all the textbooks. Someone who who drinks to, um, who drinks more than they want to. Oh. Who can't stop. But the other definition is that in order for someone to want to quit, there have to be substantial consequences. You know, for me, every day, not every day, I'm exaggerating. Every day I don't wake up with a hangover, to me, is the beginning of a good day. Because yeah. I used to have serious hangovers. You know, yeah. It wasn't like, you know, don't call the rehab, call poison, you know, call the hospital. Because when you're doing white powders and you're drinking vodka or tequila, you really wake up sick. You know, the, the, the morning mm -hmm. I decided to call the rehab, I had a really ha bad hangover. Yeah. It's beyond hangover. It's a headache that's, that's yeah. Yeah. awful. Now I don't have those anymore. Never. Isn't that great? Yeah. Never. That's great. Yeah. Never. And I go places, maybe to a great concert, and, and I see people enjoying themselves and drinking. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I might not be enjoying myself as much, but I will not be sick tomorrow morning. Yeah. And I won't be afraid to drive home at midnight either. You know, I, I was just, on. yeah. Most people. Here's, I mean, here's my, defin of, my definition of addiction. Okay. Which I taught myself. When I was doing cocaine, I did cocaine every single day for 13 years. And I mean every day. It wasn't a day that I didn't do a line or a spoon. Ooh, expensive. But not for me. Okay, uh, go ahead. And in the 13th year, after 13 years of doing it all the time, regularly, um, I would wake up in the morning and say, I'm not going to get high until after dinner. And then after lunch, I'd start getting high. Mm. Uh, I say, and I would get high anyway. I remember there's one time I was going, driving across the Golden Gate Bridge. And I had a vial of Coke in my fingers like this. You know, remember those little vials? Used to be able to buy them downtown on Sansom Street. The little vials for Coke with the little spoon. I've um, never seen it, but I'm... For, yeah. I'm for a recall. It's a built-in spoon, a little black thing. How convenient. And I'm holding it, and I have the sunroof open. I'm on the Golden Gate Bridge. I'm thinking, I'm going to throw this away. I'm going to throw this out the window. I'm going into San Francisco, I don't... And I didn't because I realized if I threw it away, I'd be admitting I had a problem. Mm. And I thought, oh, shoot. So for a year, I struggled with, I'm not going to do any lines today until dinner. And I do them after breakfast. And I thought, shit, I can't quit. This stuff has its control over me. Gotcha. For 12 years, I was like a puppeteer. I only did it when I wanted to, which was all the time. But I did mm. it every time I did it. I did it, but then I was doing it even when I didn't want to. So maybe the definition of an alcoholic is someone who says, I'm not going to drink tonight, and they drink anyway because they're no longer in control. They drink anyway. I like uh, that answer. Very, very simple, very easy to understand. You know, you know, Leonard, I want to back up a second because 
I was laughing when you said maybe I wasn't having as much fun as they were, but I'm going to wake up and feel good. My friends sometimes say the opposite about me. They say, oh, she's been drinking even though I'm sober because I am uninhibited just naturally. So I never needed that. Like, so I'll do whatever because mm-hmm. I'm just high on life. But they used to be so embarrassed. They'd be like, she's drunk. <laughs> she's drunk because they didn't want to tell people. That's how she is all the time. <laughs> so I think you can actually, and I was just at a big thing, a reunion in Avalon. And, you know, and these are, these are people that, you know, they don't drink that much, but they were really having fun at their reunion. And I didn't know anybody. So I wanted to be, not that I wouldn't have a glass of tour of wine, but I wanted to be like really like coherent and listening to all the conversations. And I just tapped into so much joy. I think I was having way more fun than anyone else. Like I really just, before I go into somewhere, I connect to my joy and then I just have them all. I have so I much you fun. want to say over time, the quality of the conversations that you were hearing was diminishing in their potency or their interest oh my they were hysterical i i wish i was had to record it you know but my point is they're if they're hysterical then that's you can't get a better conversation than if you're hysterical just laughing that's a fun conversation it just laughing away leonard what am i gonna do with you i i like there's thousands of not thousands but I'll there's like next year there's 10 more questions okay. we're not going to be able to get them questions. All right, but I'll them yes or no <laughs> here's 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 one question before we go yes do you need somebody to replace the other person because you know they're going to be calling you i'll fill the job i'll fill the job they have to live within 20 minutes of driving to studio city california oh, well there might be people there yeah you know, if they're in la I, I, they could contact me so are you going to bring in somebody else full time uh for now yeah gotcha i will definitely temporarily hire someone full-time there you go studio city you can drive there look them up all right leonard before we go thank you so much for being on and i'm so glad we did zoom this is gonna this is gonna be a hoot tell them everything how do you want them to find you find your book whatever way you want leonardbouchel.com Okay. Uh, Addiction Recovery eBulletin.org. Uh, Leonard Bouchel. If you Google me, you'll find me. You can yeah. find my Wikipedia page. Mm-hmm. Pops up. I'm easy to find. Leonard Bouchel, B U S C H E L. I have it on the back of my license on my car. And I remember when I told my mother, she says, Why do you have our name on the back of your license? I said, Because when I drive places, because every time I use my car, it's not to go to a scene of a crime. Because I used to have a really hard license yeah. to remember because yeah, yeah. if you're driving away, like, you know, like it's the hardest license letters and numbers, yeah, now yeah. it's my name. Plus it's yeah. easy when you check into a roadside motel when they want to know your license, oh, you know, your license plate number, it's my name. So there you And go. they're going to buy your book on Amazon. Dot com. <laughs> Confessions of a Cannabis Addict. There aren't that many other books called High, but I I remember one night laying in bed thinking of titles. You go through a hundred before you get to the one. And I thought, this is the only title that this book could have ever had. It couldn't be from drug dealer to drug counselor because I worked as a drug, you know, or from, from Philly to Hollywood. High, that says it all. Yeah. You know, naturally or unnaturally. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. It was, it was, uh, this is more what I look like now. Well, they, <laughs> they can see you. <laughs> but I'll tell you, when you said we had the choice of doing this audio or video, I thought, how can I attract a woman on audio? My voice isn't that pretty, but my face is. Oh, God. And I haven't been married for a few years. All right, so people, if you're listening to this audio, switch over and make sure if you're not driving that you check it out. All right, I gotta go. I can't believe 
All Listen, right, wait you. a minute. It's my nice let's... Thank you for taking me back to Philly for a little while. Oh, my pleasure. My let's but your accent real... is not that Philly. I'm originally from Jersey, but that's a whole nother story. So that's I have a kind of a accent. mixture. Spent a lot of time I in New York, Jersey. a lot of time in California. All right, but my let's keep it real people. You're going to want to share this, like it and rate it. Leonard definitely kept it real. And you know what I'm going to say. Until next time. Toodles. Bye, Leonard. Toodles.